What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? This is Hear Me Out Podcast. I am your host, Brooks. And today I have with me a fellow member of the Mikasa Isukasa Network, Robbie Yeager. Robbie, Robbie, what's up, man? What's up, man? Uh, it's good to finally be back, uh, be on the show. Uh, I, welcome you, welcome uh, to the MCSC family. I know it's, uh, I haven't been able to be on here yet to formally do that, but uh, officially, for me at least, welcome. Yes, sir. Welcome yes, to the sir. family. Yeah, thank you. Uh, honestly, it was quite a surprise for uh, for Nico to even invite us. I know he was saying that uh, you're kind of like the least scouted channel, but, you know, we got some good recommendations. So grateful for yeah. that. Hey, man, but, look, just keep plugging and it's just going to blow. It's just going to blow up. It's going to get even bigger from here, man. For sure. For sure. So let's get back to the, uh, to the subject at hand. Tomorrow is actually Earth Day. And for you, you've actually broken a, uh, a pretty huge story. One of the biggest stories actually of maybe not only just this decade, but maybe the century, uh, the North Carolina gas spill uh, with, you know, with Earth Day coming up, like I said, man, how big is this story? Uh, we know that it's kind of just infiltrating everything. So how, how important is this? So it's hugely important, um, at least in my estimation, uh, because, you know, it, it, it's not as flashy as what a lot of people may know. Uh, a lot of people, when they think about pipelines, uh, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is probably either Keystone or Dakota Access. Uh, those are the two most infamous uh, in, the, in the game right now. Um, but Colonial Pipeline, which has been around since the 1960s, uh, it runs from New Jersey down to uh, Texas to the Gulf. Uh, it, it crosses over, you know, like a dozen states in between there. It supplies about 40 percent of the East Coast uh, gasoline or fuel in general. Um, so, Again, you take that away, uh, you know, gas prices will would skyrocket and stuff like that. Um, so what it is, is the Colonial Pipeline, again, it's 5,500 miles long, but it's a critical piece of our country's infrastructure. Um, and, you know, just in just a case in point, a few years ago in 2016, there was an explosion in Alabama uh, for in the Colonial Pipeline. And there actually had to be it had to be shut down for a couple of weeks. Uh, and we had lines around gas stations. There were gas stations putting bags over their uh, nozzles, you know, basically saying they were out. It was all over the southeast. Um, so it, it's a very a piece, a uh, very important piece of infrastructure. So, you know, setting up what the pipeline actually is in August of last year, there was a spill in a nature preserve in North Carolina right outside of Charlotte. Um, so. At first, Colonial Pipeline, who was owned by Coke Industries, and you know, people may not you know, may or may not know, have heard of the Coke Brothers or the Coke. Uh, the course, they would have a hand in this. Um, it's also owned by Shell, uh, the oil company. So you know, but back to it. You know, so uh, the initial spill estimates from Colonial Pipeline came in at about sixty-three thousand gallons. Uh, a couple of months later, state regulators asked them for new estimates, and they said, "Well, it's probably closer to about two hundred and fifty thousand gallons." And then a couple of months later, the state re state regulators were looking at the paperwork and the documentation and something just wasn't adding up. Something didn't look right. Uh, so they asked Colonial to, again, uh, give them new estimates. And then they came back in January uh, as 1.2 million gallons uh, was the new total. And as a matter of fact, we just found out last week uh, that Colonial Pipeline has, again, informed regulators that that 1.2 million number uh, is still too low. And that is actually uh, not, they didn't give me specific numbers, but it's likely uh, bigger. And to put that in perspective, Brooks, the largest pipeline spill uh, on U.S. soil in, in history uh, was in 1991. It was in Minnesota. I believe it was the line three. Um, and it spilled, I think, at 1.68 million gallons. Uh, so Colonial Pipelines already got 1.2 uh, and if it gets much bigger, this spill could be uh, the largest in U.S. history. And unfortunately, outside of myself, of course, the MCSC family and then a couple of other local reporters uh, to the area, uh, you're not seeing too much about this uh, at all. Okay, well, just like you mentioned, man, um, again, MCSC, you know, we're, we're interviewing the number one uh, investigative journalist on the network. <laughs> Maybe, maybe in the country as well, when you, uh, when you continue to just break news that not everybody's paying attention to, but with that and aside, man, that that's because we don't have Whitney Webb on the, uh, on the, on the network, but that, yeah, that's and Whitney Webb is one of the, the best out there as well. She's, she's, oh my God, she absolutely. Informed. 
But um, but, yeah. go ahead. You can say. It. Oh yeah, no, I was just gonna say. I um, mean, uh, you know, so I mean, I guess you asked why is this important, and I got kind of back. I got kind of bogged down in background, uh, just because I wanted to set up what happened, right? Uh, so what's happened is that we have possibly the largest gas spill or pipeline spill in U.S. history happening right now. Um, and there's a history of neglect. You know, I, I've done a lot of reporting. So if people want to get into the nitty gritty details of the reports that have been coming out about the pipeline, I, I encourage you to do so. They're on my Rockfin. Um, you know, but to be brief about it, basically, Colonial's got a history of spills. Uh, they've got a history of barely checking their pipeline. The leak itself came from a crack. Um, and as I've mentioned before, the pipeline is 5,500 miles long. But in 2019, Colonial only checked 650 miles of it for cracks uh and if you think that's bad the year before in 2018 they only checked 150 miles of it for cracks um so you know you've got issues there you've got federal regulators coming down on them and basically saying i mean we had you know the the federal body that governs pipeline safety came out a couple of weeks ago and put out a report that said the entirety of the pipeline is a public and environmental safety risk and that the potential for a massive spill like we saw in North Carolina, uh, the potential for that kind of spill um, exists throughout the entirety of the pipeline. And as a matter of fact, possibly could be happening right now because uh, Colonial Pipeline themselves didn't even detect this spill uh, that I've been reporting on. Uh, two, two teenagers on ATVs riding through the nature preserve, they smelled gasoline and, um, you know, and then obviously they reported that, but if it wasn't for those kids that came through there and smelled the gas, it's possible the colonial could still, it, it could still be leaking for all we know oh um, because colonial by their own admission, uh, their technology isn't good enough to detect it. So it's important to know that this is happening. It's important to know that, you know, for people that support the Dakota access protests, uh, which I do. Uh, but if you find that important to you, uh, I would highly encourage you to, start reading up on this issue because Dakota Access, unfortunately, probably isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Um, however, the regulations that govern the safety of these pipelines are lackluster, they're bare bones. Um, half of them are written by the oil and gas industry themselves. Um, and we need to change this. We need to change everything we do or er everything we know about pipeline regulations and safety and how we operate uh, we need to change it all. We can change it all. This is something that Pete Buttigieg has the director or you know, secretary of transportation who oversees the pipeline system. Uh, he could walk into work tomorrow and start ordering overhauls and evaluations of everything if he chose to. Uh, this is something that, in, in, as we know, man, with politicians, they don't do anything without pressure. Uh, if, if they don't think that their seat is on the line, they're not going to make a move. Uh, so you got to make them move, but with pressure. And, you know, again, for those of you that support the DAPL protests, the last time Dakota Access had a pipe, had a spill was in May of 2020. Since then, Colonial Pipelines had 10 such incidents. Uh, so, I mean, the imminent threat is on the East Coast. And if we don't stop Colonial Pipeline, make an example of Colonial Pipeline and basically say, if you don't change the way you do business, uh, that you won't be doing business with us anymore. Um, unless we do that now, Dakota Access is going to look exactly like Colonial Pipeline in 20 years, and then we've got a serious, serious problem. So I want to ask this. Um, sure. With the level of, of spill that's going on, with the level of leakage, you know, it's, it's possible that it's, it's going to, or not infiltrate, but, you know, leak into the water table. It's possible that it's going to, you know, contaminate water. It's going to contaminate, you know, not only what people drink, but what animals are, are drinking, what, you know, North Carolina, you know, it's a lot of farmlands. That's mm -hmm. how people make a living over there. Is this, is, could this possibly be on a scale of like a Flint where people are going to end up becoming sick, animals are going to become, get sick and, and all of that? So as we know right now, um, all tests that have been done by not only Colonial's uh, third party, which we take that with a grain of salt, right? Um, of course. But, all, but also the tests that have been done uh, by state regulators. And uh, I'm not sure what's been done by federal regulators as far as soil testing, water testing. But I do know state, uh, the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality has also been overseeing a lot of uh, the testing measures and cleanup stuff. Um, so, I mean, and as of yesterday, uh, there is no reports for any of these, uh, any of these tests that they've run that any of the drinking water in the surrounding area or any of the river basin or the river itself 
uh, the nearby river, I should say, has been contaminated, right? Uh, so as of right now, the drinking water is supposedly fine with, you know, it's uh, petroleum free. Um, now, that being said, a um, couple of different things. One, the groundwater is 100% polluted. Um, and of course, any animals that were drinking uh, water that had that in there, uh, you know, obviously we wouldn't be drinking straight up out of the ground. Um, but, you know, a lot of animals probably do drink, would have come in contact with that uh, kind of contaminated water, especially considering it's on a nature preserve. Uh, there's, uh, but there's no, there's no reports of uh, large animal deaths or anything like that. Like uh, you saw 20 years ago when, again, Colonial spilled a bunch of oil into a river in South Carolina, there was like 30,000 like dead fish. Uh, something like that, where you can actually look at the damage on a, you know, looking at the animals in the, in the wildlife and say, damn, you know, this was, this was terrible. So far, no massive reports or no reports like that. Um, but there are, uh, let's see, like 4,000 times the uh, state acceptable level of carcinogens such as benzene, which you find in cigarette smoke for one, uh, and also obviously in gasoline. Um, and, gas and benzene uh, has been linked to, I want to say, leukemia, um, as well as other illnesses, uh, if consumed in large quantities by humans. Now, again, this is in the groundwater, not the drinking water. Um, but we also had a statement by the mayor of Huntersville, which is obviously the town that the, uh, the leak happened in. Um, and this is where things get kind of weird, right? So, you know, I basically just reported his statement, which he made at a town hall. Uh, or a town board meeting just a couple of nights ago where basically he's he said he was told uh, that the, the the contamination was below the water table or that the spill I'm sorry the spill had gotten below the water table um so that's a pretty uh, as far as I know and all the research I've been doing on this that's the first time I've heard that said um it's not reflected in any of the reports that I know of so far so that would be new information if it's true uh, unless he's unless the mayor is misspeaking now as far as but again i reiterate and so does the regulators and here in north carolina they also reiterate that uh and and they did so uh in response to the video i posted uh that there has been no uh tangible impacts to drinking water in the surrounding area so even if it did get into the water table there's so far there hasn't been anything to reflect that in the tests but again I, it's hard to say um like it, it it, I would like to believe that the Department of Environmental Quality is doing their own independent analysis of the water in the area, um, because at this point, um, relying on Colonial to give you actual factual information, accurate information, they can't do it with the amount of the spill. They're coming back now saying, oops, it was way deeper than we thought. Um, and by the way, they admitted that the technology that they used to get those initial estimates is no longer appropriate. Um, so honestly, even if it, if it, if it is below the water table, has it contaminated more water than they know? Nobody really knows. I mean, and on, it's just a mess. It's, it's a mess because nobody seems to have the technology adequately enough to actually tell us what happened. And, and now they've gone, they've cried wolf so many times. Uh, it's hard to believe anything they say now. So it, it's, it's kind of a mess. It sounds like it. I mean, and again, you you mentioned just a couple of years ago they only examined what was it six hundred and fifty thousand? Uh, oh no, well, it was six hundred and fifty miles. Six hundred and fifty miles out of five thousand and five hundred. So around eleven percent. That's ridiculous. Yeah, and then, yeah. and again, it's, it's it just seems like a just a, a lack of uh you know regulation, a lack of ability to a lack of transparency. I would say absolutely in in order to protect not only the citizens of North Carolina but just everybody that's going to be involved in this because 650 or how many miles again was it the pipeline i'm sorry 5500 5500 that's yeah that's just, that's scary that's it's going to impact a lot of people man mm -hmm. and uh i also want to ask you about this new scoop that you just tweeted out yeah. uh just about an hour ago actually it says here scoop new filings show colonial pipeline whose pipe spilled 1.2 million gallons of Gallions in North Carolina last year hired Joe Manchin's former lead staffer, Elliot Howard, to lobby Congress on pipeline issues. Uh, what's the impact of this report, man? Because again, we know Joe Manchin is a major thorn in the side of a, a policy going on right now. Uh, yeah. How big is this, man? 
Well, and that's the thing too. That's um to so following the story, you know, mostly what I do, like uh, other than the pipeline reporting that I've been doing, where I've just been kind of attached to the hip to the story. Uh, like primarily what I uh, what I do is like political finance stuff. So you know, uh, campaign contributions, lobbying stuff, foreign uh, FARA, foreign agent stuff, you know, that kind of thing. Nonprofits. Uh, so I'm a follow the money guy. Um. So, I mean, with all the always follow the money as an investigative journalist, guys, always was well, the best way to find out where allegiances lie always. Um, but, you know, so, you know, following the lobbying scene like I do, you know, you're used to seeing, OK, you know, like the big companies, Microsoft, Salesforce, stuff like that. Uh, they want to. I mean, it, it's it, they do it right out in the open, right in your face. They're hiring people that used to work for these senators or representatives uh, to come work for them at their lobbying firm. And then they send these lobbyists back to the representatives and senators they used to work for and try to talk them into uh, passing or denying legislation that will benefit the client that they work for. Um, that is what we call the revolving door uh, because they come and go and come and go. They leave the lobbying firm, go back to Congress, leave Congress, go back to the lobbying firm. And it's all just a big, it's the, it's the political industrial complex. Uh, and once we get to, it, and especially now, once you start getting to companies that are probably having a rough go of things um, at, the, at the moment uh, that may need a helping hand from maybe an ease of regulations uh, on themselves or tougher regulations on competitors, uh, stuff like stuff like that, uh, you start seeing, uh, yeah, they're going to start spending money on lobbying the federal government. So, uh, you know, that being said, it wasn't much of a surprise. I mean, I've been waiting for Colonial, uh, honestly, to make a move lobbying wise. I mean, it, it, it's an obvious thing that there was an obvious play to make. Uh, I was expecting, I mean, quite honestly, uh, maybe this is just me being a rookie reporter. I was expecting uh colonial to hire a big firm right you know somebody with some major weight uh and some name recognition but what they did was a lot more subtle and as you mentioned joe manchin is uh, apparently a very powerful man uh and a very important man and that can sway the entirety of the united states congress uh, on certain issues it's is president is, is pre president manchin really uh and <laughs> and, and, and lobbying Lobbying firms have noticed this, um, and uh, while Colonial didn't go out and make a splashy hire with a brand big name firm, what they did do uh, was take advantage of a longtime firm of theirs, uh, Jim Massey Partners is the name of the company, who hired Elliot Howard, who, like I said, as you mentioned, uh, was a former lead staffer for Joe Manchin um, at, up until March of this year when he left to go work for this lobbying firm. Wow. Um, and mentioned, by the way, is the chairman of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, uh, which obviously is going to have a lot of uh, say in legislation that impacts the pipeline industry. Um, so given those things, like given the fact that Jim, Joe Manchin is apparently the most powerful senator or politician in America, and uh, basically, Joe Manchin is everybody is is who uh, the Republicans want AOC to be, man. As as far as power and influence goes, I mean, because think about it. I mean, as since Joe Biden has been president, any major moves that have come through the Senate have come and gone at the behest uh, or at the whims of Joe Manchin, pretty much. Should um, be getting paid five, fifteen dollars an hour, but hey, Joe <laughs> Manchin says no. So Joe Manchin Parliamentary says no. Says no. Um. So, yeah, it's a shrewd move by taking the guy that not only was a lead staffer to Joe Manchin, uh, he was the lead staffer to Joe Manchin on the energy committee, right? So, I mean, Joe Manchin is on several committees, and I'm sure he has staffers for several of those committees as well, just because each committee has its own thing, and there's just, it, it's its own little world. And you walk out of one committee and into another you know, there's a whole new stack of paperwork and a whole new stack of research waiting on you. Um, and I'm sure he had, I'm sure they all have separate staffs for all of these. But the fact is, is that Howard, Elliot Howard was the lead staffer for Joe Manchin uh, for years on that committee, on that exact committee that's going to be governing uh, the pipeline legislation. And of course he's lobbying pipeline legislation. So you put two and two together and you basically see that <laughs> Colonial Pipeline has a member, a former member of Joe Manchin's uh, like inner circle lobbying Joe Manchin uh, on behalf of pipeline companies, um, specifically the one that is in hot, hot water right now. So 
while this might not be like an earth shattering scoop, right? And a lot of my stuff isn't going to be, right? Um, this is just, again, another link in the chain, another cog, you know, another cog in the machine. Uh, it, it's basically saying, hey, this is how influence, this is how you pedal influence. Uh, you know, this is how you sell access. Um, and look, this is how, that's a smart move. If you're colonial, you're feeling really good about yourself because you're like, hey, I've got an inside man so one of the most powerful people in DC. Um, so, I mean, look, it, it, it stands to reason uh, that Colonial Pipeline is trying to get into the ear of somebody in the federal government uh, to hopefully, what it seems to me would be the mid a mitigate the damage that, I mean, the federal government's going to find them. It's just a matter of how much. I've reached out to the Department of Justice, the Environmental Crimes Division, um, and asking whether or not they're actually going to open their own investigation. I have yet to hear back, but I do know that they have gotten my, uh, gotten my question. So maybe we can hear something soon. Um, so, because I mean, look, the DOJ sued colonial pipeline in the year 2000, uh, for spilling 3 million gallons of fuel over the previous 20 years. So between 1980 and 2000, um, eventually in Oh three colonial settled for about $39 million. Um, so it's been 20 years since then, uh, since their initial lawsuit. And in that 20 years, Colonial Pipeline has spilled way more uh, fuel than they did in the 20 years previous. Uh, so if you're going to sue them for the previous 20 years, there's got to be something coming from the DOJ for the last 20 years, because the last 20 years have been like twice as bad as the ones before. Um, so, man, the bottom line is we need accountability from Colonial. Um like I said, they need to be making an example out of, they need to be dragged in front of Congress because what it's been, uh, you know, it's environmental neglect. For one thing, it's a neglect. It's, it's criminal neglect. It's terrible. Um, it's going to impact a lot other, of lives, man. Yeah, and, and, and in any other in, in any other space, that type of incompetence uh, would either lose your business license, like if I was a realtor or a lawyer or a doctor, I would not be able to be one of those things anymore if I sucked at my job that bad. Um and also, uh, in any other space, it would be criminal, um, and there would be some accountability. But unfortunately, and this is the other part of the conversation, really, uh, it's not only do we need to hang Colonial up in front of everybody, hold them up and say, hey, this isn't how you're going to be able to do business from going forward, but we got to revamp all of the rules and regulations on the, on the government side uh, of how we maintain safety of our pipelines. Because, look, I personally... In a perfect world, I'd say no pipelines, right? Because I'm not a fan. I don't, I, you know, I, I think that we are beyond uh, the time in our in our society where we could have way come up with something better for this by now. But it's a capitalist thing, and, and that's what any, it really all boils down to. And if anybody will tell you that Joe Biden is going to be good for the environment, they are lying to you. They are completely beholden to the DNC. That's that's a damn lie. That's a lie. Yeah, it's Same a damn lie. Period. Yeah, well, I, because he, you know, he shut. The, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, it's okay. Uh, I just, I just, and I just wanted to say this too. Um, before I, I give you back the microphone. No, no, uh, yeah, I'll talk the, enough. You, you don't, you don't need to. Uh, like this is the, this is why people shouldn't be allowed to be careers as politicians as lobbyists because again, mm -hmm. these type of situations with Flint, with uh, with the Colonial Pipeline right now, uh, any any kind of major oil spill, any kind of infrastructure spill when you just allow people to just have power and use their money to destroy things, this is what happens. You have a crumbling empire and it's because of lobbyists and because of corrupt politicians. Uh, Robbie, back to you. No, yeah, I was just gonna, you're, you're hundred percent right. We look, the lobbying aspect of this uh, is, you know, like I said, it's not unique to colonial at all. It's just another illustration of how the industry works. Another cog in machine. Yep. Yep. And that's all it is. It's just a giant machine. And sometimes uh, some cogs get a little bit more greased than others. Right. And uh, you know, that's just the way, unfortunately it's the way that it works. Uh, and it, you know, so a, a, a 10 year lobbying ban, at least uh, look, a lobbying ban period would be fantastic. Um, money out of politics period. Never going to happen. Right. There's too much money in it. Uh, but yeah. I do, but, there has been lobbying bans kicked around in the past. Trump himself had one uh, that was said, basically, you can't lobby the federal government until five years after you've left my administration uh, by whatever means. But in his last couple of days in office, he said, psych, and he uh, canceled his own executive order, uh, which had the lobbying ban in it. Um, 
there was proposed lobbying bans in the past. I, I, I want to say HR1 has one in it. Uh, look, I'm not going to fight that. A, a lobbying ban is a lobbying ban. And, you know, I, I just think that we, it's way past time for that because there's too much money in our politics. Uh, there's too much money coming from sources we don't know about, uh, which is kind of what got me into this game in the first place because I got curious as to where the money was coming from and where it was going. Um, you know, the, the way I always break down campaign finance is basically just like this. Uh, you know, you, you got, you're, you're, you're a hardworking person. You work a part-time job. Maybe you got a full-time job if you're lucky. Um, but you feel compelled to donate to a politician that you feel strongly about. Um, so you send them your hard earned $20, $20. Um, that very same day, the CEO, of, uh, who knows Chevron, right? What else to say that, um, he likes that politician too. And so he decides that he's going to send him his not so hard earned, honestly, uh, you know, not at all $2,900, right. Or he's going to donate. 10 million to a super PAC that runs positive ads about this politician. Um, so when this politician goes to work the next day, he's going to have two envelopes. One envelope will have a $20 bill in it and the other envelope will have about $2,900 in it. Um, so whenever he opens those envelopes and then he goes about his day, whenever he's making decisions, who do you think he's thinking about? Is he thinking about the person that sent him the 20 or is he thinking about the person that sent him the 2000? Um, I always, as jaded, cynical as me, I mean, you're going to be, you want another 2000. So you're going to do what you got to do to get another 2000. Uh, and, you know, honestly, it's, that's the way it works. That's why uh, we really need, I mean, look, our government is a big, big pile of crap <laughs> and we have many, many problems. Uh, but until we get the money out of it and these guys are actually public servants, uh, you know, no more trading stocks, uh, no more behind the no more backroom dealing. Um, if you want to be a public servant, if you want to serve your country, then you should be forced to live off of a public servant's salary. Yeah. Uh, and you, you shouldn't know, be able to make is, a career out of it. But it's six. It's also a six-digit salary. Like, yeah. <laughs> like that's more money than I'm ever going to see. So, I mean, to me, these politicians complaining about having to give up their stuff. You know, like. Oh, I don't want to like, you know, with the Pelosi stuff, you know, like that I reported a couple of weeks ago and, you know, somebody had said that she uh, kind of like had a hand in blocking an amendment to HR one that would have required congressmen and women and their spouses to put all of their assets in a blind trust until after I'll be, they were out of office. I'll be providing an article to that link or a link to that article in the yeah. description if you want to read that as well. Yeah, it's a great article and it kind of like it, it was released a couple of weeks before you know, what my reporting on her Microsoft trade, you know, which, you know, it's a whole different can of beans, right? But, you know, being said, it's just one of those, another reason why, uh, you know, the money, the money aspect of our, of our politics is so important. If you remove all of that incentive for these politicians to get rich uh, off of public service, as it's supposed to be, uh, then you find out how bad they really want to be a public servant. Because if you told them um, that, Oh yeah, you want to do if you want to do this, you got to give up X, Y, and Z. Well, now we really know if you don't want to give up X, Y, and Z, then you don't want to be a public servant bad enough, uh, and we don't want you to be one because you're not in it for the right reasons. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not like that. And as we see from every aspect of it, from Colonial Pipeline, to Joe Manchin to Nancy Pelosi, and everything in between, you know, uh, money makes the world go around, and it's not going away anytime soon. My guy or gal, thanks for watching this video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, hit the notification bell, and share this video for the latest on sports, progressive politics, and pop culture. Slack.